is amen. So once again, this is the way to a wonderful life. And our way to a wonderful life message for today is taking us back to the great Charles Fillmore, his book, Prosperity. And you can buy that book on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And it's called Prosperity by Charles Fillmore, who is the founder of the Unity Movement and the, the Unity School of, of Practical Christianity. This, this message today, or this lesson today, is taken from Chapter 9, Lesson 9, Tithing, The Road to Prosperity, The Road to Prosperity. Now, this lesson is for all of you who desire financial increase or to eliminate financial struggle and lack from your life. Now, we know as we go through this lesson that we must use our spiritual discernment because all, all manner of teachers have ideas about tithing. Tithing is really just giving. It's giving. And we know that if we want to be in tune with the infinite, then we must connect ourselves with the infinite. We must involve ourselves with our faith. And I think that a great way for us to involve ourselves with our faith is to give, is to tithe. Now, some people say that a tithe is 10%, and Charles Fillmore brings that out in our lesson today. But I believe that we can use any percentage, any percentage that we're comfortable with, because for some people, a tithe of 10% makes them uncomfortable and makes them feel a financial struggle, and God does not want us to have any kind of sacrifice or obligation going on into our mind, because as Jesus tells us, freely give and freely receive, but I'm here to tell you that our giving, our giving to to our, our church or to our spiritual organization or to those things that lift us up into that higher realm of faith and belief that all things work to our good should be a percent. You know, my, my previous in my previous life, I was an accountant before I came into the ministry. So I understand numbers. Mathematics is a law, a universal, changeless, immutable law. And so we use a percentage because then we have evidence of the increase that we're seeking to realize in our life experience. Even if we give 2%, 3%, 4%, and for those who give 10%, and there are people that are, there are people that give even more. I think it was uh, Carnegie that gave, uh, gave 20 or 30% of his income to his church or his religious charitable organizations. And we have to realize that through, uh, through, through our giving, that we connect ourselves. We connect ourselves to something greater than what we see in the world. You know, Jesus said, be in the world, but not of the world. So we want to connect with that otherworldliness, that spirit that guides us, directs us, that moves through our mind, our heart, and our soul, and brings forth into our mind, to our awareness, that good desires that we can make, be made, that can be made manifest through our faith. So we do that, we connect with that, we involve ourselves in it, through tithing, through giving. So if we give the, the percentage, then we shall see that percentage of increase as it comes into our mind. We give 2% today in our, and we, we give $10 and we give 2% and we have an increase and we're going to give 11 or $12. So as we take that into our mind and start getting involving ourselves with our faith, and as we involve ourselves with our faith, we start involving ourselves in demonstrating through our, putting our faith into work so that we can realize God's blessings in a greater way and start multiplying those blessings in our life experience. Now, under the Mosaic Law of Tithing, which was the tenth, it was required as the Lord's portion. Throughout the Old Testament, the tithe or tenth is mentioned as a reasonable and just return to the Lord by way of acknowledging Him as the source of supply. But it doesn't have to be ten. You know, there's no superstition in the law of God. There's only there's only the law. As we sow, so shall we reap. So the, the tenth is nice and it's wonderful. And if you can give ten percent of your income to to a, a church or to a spiritual organization or so, to someone, a spiritual teacher that lifts your mind into a higher realm of confidence and self-assurance, then do it. But don't, don't be afraid to start with 2%. And don't feel like somehow you're robbing God of, of God's share of your good. Because God doesn't, as I stated before, God does not demand a sacrifice. So let's not get into that superstitious stuff. Now, there will be a reward following the giving. We are also assured by Jesus and a direct promise. He says, give, and it shall be given unto you. 
Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall they give into your bosom. For with what measure you meet, what, what measure you give, it shall be measured back to you again. Now, promises of spiritual benefits and increase of God's abundance through the keeping of this divine law of giving and receiving abound in all the scripture. There is that scattereth and increaseth yet more, and there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth only to want. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that hath a bountiful eye, an abundant eye, shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Blessed are ye that sow, sow beside all waters. We are living now under larger and fuller blessings from God than man has ever known. It is, it is therefore necessary that we give accordingly and remember the law of the tithe. For if a tenth was required under the law in those olden times, it is certainly no, no less fitting that we should give it cheerfully now. Let's go back and say that tenth is a percentage. One of the greatest incentives to generous giving is a keen appreciation of the blessings secured to us through the teaching and the healing work of Jesus. Freely you have received, freely give. True giving is the love and the generosity of the Spirit, quickening our heart, responding to the love and the generosity of God's heart and God's love for us. Giving is a grace that adds to the spiritual growth of everyone in all times. Without giving, the soul shrivels, but when giving is practiced as a part of our livingness, the soul expands and becomes godlike in the grace of liberality and generosity. No restoration to the likeness of God can be complete unless mind, heart, and soul are daily opening out into that larger, free-bestowing spirit which so characterizes our God and our Father. In order that the plan of giving may be successful, now this is from Charles Stillmore, in order for that the plan of giving may be successful, there are several things that must be observed. First, there must be a willing mind, willing mind. If the readiness is there, it is acceptable according as a man hath, not according to as he hath not. God loves a cheerful giver. Secondly, the giving must be done in faith, and there must be no withholding because the offering seems small. So many times people are embarrassed that their tithe is so small, or that what they give is so small. But that, you know, there's no greater small in our givingness. It's that willingness and that giving from my heart that makes everything, that makes everything worthy. That makes everything worthy. It's that willingness to give. It's that willingness to involve ourselves with our faith and with because uh, and allow ourselves to become in tune with god now a lot of people say well do i have to give money well if you if you want to see prosperity and financial increase in your life money is the thing remember money is god in action money is god in action money was an idea an idea that god gave to man so that we can give and we can use that money to give to people all across the globe who will never meet and see them benefited and know that they're benefited by our giving them. So money is God in action. Let's go back to Fillmore. Many of the many of the instances of giving that are recorded in the Bible as worthy of special mention or commendation and blessing are instances where the gift itself was small. The widow who fed Elijah in his time of famine gave him a cake made with her last handful of meal. For her faith and her generous spirit, she was rewarded with a plentiful daily supply of food for herself and her sons, as well as for Elijah. The jar of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail. This same truth is set forth beautifully in the New Testament, for it is clearly shown that not the amount of the offering, but the spirit in which it is given determines its value and power. And he, Jesus, sat down over against the treasury and beheld how the multitude cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a poor widow, and she cast in two mites. I guess two mites would be something like two cents. 
which make which make a farthing. And he called upon him his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, This poor widow cast in more than all that are casting into the treasury, for they all did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So it was her faith that Jesus was telling us made, made the demonstration for her to receive more. This poor widow exemplified what it is to give in faith, and wherever, and where, and even those two, two, two mites or two cents, whatever it was, so great a gift as when they brought forth such praise from the Master himself. The results of giving in faith are just as sure in this age as it was in the time of Jesus, for the law is unfailing in all ages. A third requisite for keeping the law of giving and receiving is that the offering shall be a just and fair proportion of all that one gives. There is a certain definiteness about this, and yet it admits of freedom for the giver to exercise his individual faith, judgment, and will. And that's why that's why I believe, and I believe this to be true, and that's why I think our tithe does not have to be 10%. You know, let's say to the glory of God, I am blessed if I can give the 10% or the 15% or the 20% like Dale Carnegie. But if, I, if it causes me to have a sacrifice not to, and causes me not to meet my other financial obligations, then give the 2%. Even if you only give 1%. But make sure it's a percentage. Give that percentage so as you consistently give a percentage, you will see the increase because the increase must come forth because our faith must be made whole in all things that we do, all things that we involve ourselves with when we're involving ourselves with God, with the, with the spirit that created us, that brings forth into our mind, into our awareness, all the ideas that will prosper us and and bring us into that greater greater life experience of prosperity and joy and health and happiness. So there is a certain definiteness about this, and yet it admits of freedom for the giver to exercise their individual faith, judgment, and will, will. And so we allow that to be the truth for us, just as it was for those people in Jesus' time. True spiritual giving rewards with a double joy, First, that which comes with making the gift. We all feel good when we give. You know, we just went through the <clears throat> excuse me. We just went through the Christmas season where we're all giving gifts and 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 bringing happiness to people around uh, who we love. And we know that there's a joy in giving. So that the, our spiritual giving rewards with a double joy. First, that which comes with making the gift, offering to a church or spiritual teacher that we appreciate. Then the joy of sharing our prosperity with others. Because we know that when we give to our church or to a, a spiritual teacher, we know that that money, that that money is going to be used to spread a message of hope and love and, and inclusiveness to all the people in the world who are willing to receive that message and that we're part of bringing that message forth into the world, into the consciousness so that people can hear it, so people can learn from it. So Charles Fillmore tells us, even the so-called heathen recognize giving as part of worship, for we find them coming with offerings when they worship their idols. All ages and all religious dispensations have stressed giving as a vital part of their worship. In this age, now he's talking about the, the 30s or the 40s, in this age of the 1900s, 1930s, 1940s, in this age when we have so much, more is required of us, even to the giving of ourselves with all that we are and have. This privilege carries immeasurable benefits with it, for it looses us from the personal life and unifies us with the universal, and so opens our inner and outer life to the inflow and the outflow of the life, love, abundance, and grace of God. This is the blessed result of faithfulness in following the law and exercise of the grace of giving. So we know that this is the truth. Jesus said, he who has much will have even more still. And he who is, has less, he who has little, will have even less. So we must know that we always have something to give, whether it's 1%, 2%, 3%, 10%, 15%, 20%.
whatever it may be. We have something to give, and as we give it, we can know that we're entering into that, that kingdom of the spirit, that kingdom of prosperity and joy and abundance and love and happiness and peace and all harmony and allowing ourselves to be a part of it in a greater way. Let's go back to Fillmore. He says, the act of giving complies with the divine law because it involves the recognition of God as the giver of all increase. And unless we have a recognition of the source of our supply, we have no assurance of continuing in its use. Many people have doubts as to whether it will really do any good to, to ask God for protection and for plenty in regard to crops or other supplies. Many who are employed in cities or who are in business think it's strange that they should believe in omnipresent prosperity. This unbelief is present with them at the very time when an unwavering faith is most necessary. There is a psychological reason why people should obey spiritual law. When a person obeys the law of God along any line, his faith immediately becomes strengthened in proportion and his doubts disappear. When anyone puts God first in his finances, not only in thought but in every act, by releasing his first fruits, that is a, a percentage of his increase or income, to the Lord, to the Lord's work, his, faith, his or her faith in omnipresent supply becomes a hundredfold stronger and they prosper accordingly. Obeying this law gives us an inner knowing that as that that we are building our finances on a sure foundation that will not fail us, that will not fail us. You know, recently I read a, 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 an article in the newspaper that the, the Pew Research poll, the, the Pew poll, which is a nationwide poll, uh, polled people about giving, and it said 47% of wealthy people give first to their church or their spiritual teacher or the spiritual organization that they associate themselves with and because they do that to sustain their wealth to realize that God is their source and that this source is greater than any resource that they may have in the material world that God is our God is our source of every good thing every good idea that prospers us every good thing that comes to us that brings us compensation and as we realize that and know it within our consciousness and we give accordingly, then we shall find ourselves, we shall find ourselves with an increased faith and an increase of every good thing that we can imagine for ourselves. We must look to the increase, and that's why we, look, that's why we give a percentage, so that we can identify the increase and realize that God is working, working actively through our consciousness to bring forth that greater life, that more wonderful life, that more abundant life that Jesus told us is ours to receive. So let's go back to Fillmore. Everything in the universe belongs to God. And though all things are for the use and enjoyment of mankind, we can possess nothing so.